Moses says, at that time, I begged, I pleaded with God, please let me go across the Jordan into the promised land. But God says, no, don't ask me again. And he didn't. But this entire portion from 323 to about halfway through chapter 7 is uh, just an amazing, amazing Torah portion. Last night, after we lit the candles and had dinner, Robin and Lindsay and I sat down in the living room. And so I, I asked Robin, well, what did you think of the Torah portion? A lot of times, oh, I found this interesting or that. Or there were some questions. But this time, if, I hope I'm not embarrassing Robin. She just kind of lit up. She says, I just couldn't get over all the things that are packed into this. And it's like, yeah, <laughs> try to teach it. <laughs> yeah, there's so much here. So we're just, I'm just going to pick out a few things. But if, when you read this, if you read it two or three times, it's almost, I, I think the name, even though it says Moses was pleading with God, it's almost as if God is pleading with the people. Trust me. Love me. Don't be afraid of the enemies out there. Keep my commandments because they're your wisdom. They're your knowledge. They're your protection. Just stay close. Stay tight. Don't forget what you've learned. It's like he's pleading with them. Don't fall away from me. Keep close to me. You know what I mean? And you hear that heart cry come out through this entire Torah portion. And it's... uh, it's really an amazing passage. So if you haven't read it, I hope after the teaching you'll go home and read it. And if you have read it, I hope you read it again in light of the things we'll be discussing. So let's pick it up actually in chapter 4. Chapter 4. And it says there in verses 1 and 2. Now, O Israel, Shema, here, Listen to the decrees and to the ordinances that I teach you to perform, so that you may live, and you will come and possess the land that Adonai, the God of your forefathers, gives you. You shall not add to the word that I command you, nor shall you subtract from it, to observe the commandments of Adonai, your God, that I command you. So he says, do not add, don't subtract, don't take away from it. And then in chapter 5, in verse 29, now if you're reading from an English Bible, it'll be verse 32. But there it says, um, did I get the wrong verse in mind? It says, you shall not deviate from, oh, I'm still chapter 4, there we go. 5.29 in my Bible, you shall be careful to act as Adonai your God commanded you. You shall not stray to the right or to the left. Now let's put these side by side. What is being discussed here? There are four things we can do to mistreat God's word. We can add to it. We can take away from it. We can stray from it to the right. We can stray from it to the left. Now, if we can avoid these four errors, we're going to be doing just fine. Now, if you look at Judaism, traditional Judaism has a habit of adding to the Torah. I brought in volume three of the Kizkor Shulchan Aruch. Shulchan Aruch means the prepared table. I have five volumes, or five volumes in this set. But this is not the complete Shulchan Aruch. This is a summary. These five volumes are a summary of the Shulchan Aruch. So what is the Shulchan Aruch, you ask? It was written by Rabbi Joseph Caro in Safat, Israel, back in the 1500s. And what it does, it goes into all the details of how to keep the commandments. All the details. And it was a massive work. And it's so massive that somebody condensed it down to just five volumes. Let me just read to you, and, and just a few excerpts, and I'm not doing this. Please don't hear me. I'm, I'm not trying to poke fun at Judaism. I am not trying to make a joke of it in any way. 
Because these people, the Orthodox Jews, take this extremely seriously. And most of them do it out of, of great love for God. They really believe this is what God wants them to do. Okay, you understand that? So I'm not going to mock it. But what we're about to read is part of what Peter calls the, um, the, the burden. That it was the, the yoke that neither our fathers could bear nor can we. Because it really is an impossible yoke. Here's an example. I, I, this is the section on Sabbath, about how to keep the Sabbath. And it says here, um, you know, you're, it says you're not allowed to cook on the Sabbath. The, the Torah doesn't say that. It's just the, the, the Shulchan Aruch says that. You can't cook on the Sabbath. So, what if you have some hot soup? Can you put crackers or bread in the soup? Would that be a form of cooking? I mean, if you put some matzo or some bread in your soup, will not it be cooking the bread? Stay tuned. It is prohibited to pour very hot soup from a pot onto pieces of bread or matzah. Rather, one who wishes to eat a soup with bread or matzah should first pour the soup into a bowl and let it cool off somewhat until it is fit to be eaten. And afterward... Place the bread or matzah there in the soup. However, as long as the soup is very hot, even if it is no longer in the pot but was put in a bowl, one is prohibited to place bread or matzah into it because the soup will cook the bread. And you can't cook. It's already cooked, but you're cooking it more. You're changing its form. You know that, and I know that. But this says no. No. You see the yoke? This is a heavy yoke. Oh, let me just give you a couple more. 153, page 153, this is what it says. It is, okay, girls, you all look so lovely, so nice, you combed your hair before you came. You may have sinned when you did that. It depends. It is prohibited for a girl to braid her hair on Shabbos or to undo her braid. However, she may neaten her hair by hand. And regarding a brush that is made from boar bristle, which is generally soft and will not tear out hair, if it is very firm, the bristles are very firm, that it is impossible for it not to tear out hairs, then it is prohibited to brush her hair with it. She cannot brush her hair. See, the problem is if you pull a hair out, you've done work, you violated the Sabbath. So, she may neaten her hair with it, And certainly she may use soft brush bristles to neaten her hair if she designates it for this purpose, for Shabbat use. So, if you comb your hair and a hair comes out, you violated the Sabbath. So you have to use very soft bristles. And they take this extremely seriously. Let me give you just one more example. Okay, here's a question. It's Sabbath. The candles are lit. You have a tablecloth and maybe cloth napkins, and something catches on fire. Can you put it out? That would be work. Can you put it out? Well, you can, but you have to do it this way. Regarding a garment, a towel, or a tablecloth that has caught fire, it is permitted to pour other liquids other than water on it. You can't pour water on it. You can pour your soup on it. <laughs> not direct, and also, not directly in the place of the fire. Because then you're doing work, you're actually putting out the fire. You pour it around the fire. Then as the fire burns, it hits the wet part. Then it goes out. Okay? So, you pour liquid, but not water. Not water. It can't be water. So, so that when the fire reaches the location of the liquid, it will be extinguished by itself. But it is prohibited to pour water on it, even on a part that has not caught fire. Now, you know why? You know why you can't pour water on a cloth that's on fire? Because you're not allowed to do laundry on Shabbat. And putting water on a piece of cloth might have the effect of making it cleaner. You can't do that. You pour your soup on it, you're fine. Do you understand? Now, there's five volumes of this 
in the condensed summary of the full thing. And these people, the Jewish people, out of their love and devotion to God, their commitment to their traditions, they follow this, they study it, they memorize it, and they're so cautious. But does this sound like you're making the Sabbath a delight? Does this sound restful to you? I would imagine myself, when I saw it getting to be sundown on Friday night, I would start to think, oh no, I'm going to break, I'm going to do something wrong. I'd be so tense and so, you know, I'd be, my stomach would be in knots that I might do something wrong. Flip a light switch. Open the refrigerator and the light bulb comes on. I violated the Sabbath. You have to unscrew the light bulb in your fridges, by the way, before Sabbath. And... Um, Oh, and get this. If you forget to unscrew the light bulb and you open the refrigerator door and the light comes on, that's fire. So you've created a fire. That's a problem. So you just want to close the door, right? No, 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 no. It says you need to call your rabbi to find out what you need to do. Consult your rabbi. Except you can't use a phone on Shabbat. You can't drive a car to Shabbat. Yeah, I guess you just leave the refrigerator door open until sundown Saturday night. These are the kinds of nuts that people get tied into. This is the sort of thing where add additions have been made to the Torah. Now, before you start thinking, oh, those Jews, they're always adding to the Torah. (laughs) Uh, I can show you a lot of Christian denominations that are adding to God's word all the time. All the time. And all of us, to some degree or other, have been guilty to adding things to the Bible the Bible doesn't say. But it says you don't take away either. In other words, you never see a commandment say, ah, that's done away with. Ah, that was for them. That's for the Jewish people. It's not for me. That's taken away. The Torah is perfect. I know that because Psalms tells me that David says the Torah of Adonai is perfect. And the moment you add something to it or you take something away from it, it's less than perfect. Now, what does it mean not strain to the right or to the left, okay? Right is always the spiritual. The left is always the physical. What we can do is we can spiritualize commandments. Like I know a a lot of my wonderful Christian brothers and sisters uh, will get in a discussion and we'll start talking about Passover. And I'll say, have you ever done the Passover Seder? No, but I've read about it. I've studied it. We had Jews for Jesus come in and do one for us. So they're saying, I understand. They spiritualize it away. say, I don't need to do it, even though Jesus says, do this in remembrance of me. They say, I, I understand it. Uh, do you keep Sabbath? I keep every day as a Sabbath. I just live in, uh, in the resting in the Lord. Well, that's wonderful, but do you keep the Sabbath? Okay? The seventh day, do you guard it and protect it to keep it holy? So we can spiritualize things away and say, I've done it when actually we haven't done it at all. On the other hand, you can stray to the left where it just becomes a physical thing. I kept a Sabbath. Oh, did you enjoy it? No, but I kept it. Well, they didn't call the Sabbath a delight, then something's wrong. So we can make it so physical and literal that we will keep a commandment mechanically, like a robot, But we're not drawing closer to God. We're not having an intimate relationship with him. You follow what I'm saying? So if we can keep from adding to God's word, take it away from God's word, avoid spiritualizing it away into nothing, or just treat it like it's just physical. If we can avoid those extremes, we're going to do just fine. Paul tells us in Romans 2.20 that the Torah is a corrector of the foolish, it's a teacher of the immature. Oh, I'm sorry, the Jews are correctors, the foolish teacher of the mature. And they have, having in the Torah the embodiment, the embodiment of knowledge and of truth. The Torah is the embodiment of knowledge and truth. And then a few chapters later in chapter 7, Paul tells us something very important. The Torah is holy. The Torah is holy. And the commandment is holy and righteous, and good. For we know that the Torah is spiritual. The Torah 
is spiritual. Here I'm holding up the Torah, the book of Deuteronomy at least. There it is. And it's okay to call this the Torah. But this is more of a photograph of the Torah. Because the Torah itself is spiritual. And this is the communication of God's heart to me in words and ink. in, In black and white to me. But the Torah itself is bigger than can be contained in any book. The Torah is spiritual. And we need to realize that. And when we obey the commandments of the Torah, we bring the spiritual into the physical. We elevate the mundane to the holy. And God and his people connect more and more and more. And the kingdom of of heaven is brought to earth a little bit. Every time we submit a physical act to God's authority. Remember the picture. The tabernacle, all the materials of the tabernacle came from where? Egypt. The plan for the tabernacle came from where? From heaven. God tells Moses, you make the tabernacle according to the pattern I showed you on the mountain. So the pattern was spiritual. The materials were physical. And when you submitted the materials to the pattern that came from God, you had a dwelling place where God could dwell with his people. And every time you take a bit of your energy, a bit of your time, a bit of your possessions, and you submit them to the authority of God's plan called the Torah, his word, what happens? He tabernacles with you a bit more. See that? You bring him closer to earth. You draw closer to him. So, we we just not forget this important principle. Let's go on down to verse uh, verse 5. Chapter 4, verse 5. Listen to what he says. This is so important. Moses says, See, I have taught you decrees and ordinances, as Adonai my God has commanded me, to do so in the midst of the land to which you come to possess it. You shall guard and do them. Guard them and do them. If you don't guard them, you'll let them slip, then you'll forget to do them. So you guard them, you keep them in your mind, review them, and then you do them. And why? Because it, this, this obedience to God's word, is your wisdom and discernment in the eyes of who? The eyes of who? What does it say? The eyes of the peoples, the Gentiles. Who shall hear all these decrees and you shall say, this is what the peoples will say. If they see you keeping my word, this is what the people around you, the people of the world will say. Surely a wise and discerning people is this great nation. For which is a great nation that has a God who is close to it as is Adonai our God whenever we call on him. Isn't that amazing? And which is a great nation that has righteous decrees and ordinances, such as this entire Torah, the entire Torah, it doesn't say parts of the Torah, the entire Torah that I place before you this day. I want you to look at something. Here's a satellite image of the Middle East. And Israel is a little dot right along there. That's Israel, okay? That little bit right there. Can you see it? Oh, I guess you can't. Let me blow it up a little bit. Here's the Mediterranean Sea. There you can see Italy. See the boot of Italy? And so you go east on the Mediterranean Sea. When you hit land, that's Israel. Right there. Okay? Egypt is down here. Down here is Africa. This is Africa. Over here, you've got Asia Minor. And then as you keep going east, you go on up into uh, Asia proper. Over here is Europe. And I know that doesn't show up. And where do the all three connect? If you ever go to Israel and you have a good guide like we had last, last year, he will take you and he will explain to you. He'll go take you up on the mountain. He'll show you the Via Maras, which is the sea route that came right through Israel where all the, the traffic from Asia, Europe, and Africa would pass through. Then over here, it's a little bit around the mountains. You have another trade route. But all the major trade routes went right through Israel. 
This is the land got picked, and here's one of the main reasons. He wanted his people to basically, whoops, be in a fishbowl. He wanted them to be in a place where the people of Africa and of Asia and of Europe will all have to be forced to pass through their land and see and think, wow, what a wise and discerning people. What people on earth have a God that dwells so close to them as this people? He put them on display by putting them where he did. He put them on display like a lamp put on a, on a, on a hill. Like sitting on a hill or a lamp put on a lampstand. He wanted everybody to see. This is also why when they mess up, they are punished so extremely. Because as long as they're providing a good testimony to the world, God is going to bless them so much that the world just be attracted. We want what you have. But when they mess up, God has let the world see. You don't get away as my people the messing up like this. And he had to scatter them. Then he bring them back. And then he scattered it again. And we live in a time when they're being brought back again. But he wants his people to be on display in this land so the people of the world can see them and say, it says, it's your wisdom and discernment in the eyes of the peoples. And they'll say, what a, what a God. What a nation. What nation has God dwelling so close to it as this nation? You understand? That's the way God wants you to be. You're not to put yourself on display. But God wants your light to so shine among men that they see your good works. And what makes your works good? If you're doing them according to the word of God. So they see your good works and give glory to who? To you? No, your father in heaven. You're the light in the world that illuminates who your God is. Because when they come to you, you're not going to talk about you. You're going to talk about him. When your good works overflow into the people around you and they talk with you, they're going to hear about him. You understand? So each one of you is like a little Canaan land, like a little people of Israel. If you've conquered the territory God's given you and you're victorious in your life, then you're going to be a light to the world, at least to the world that's right around you. You're going to be like a little Israel. Follow? It's a beautiful picture. Keep that in mind. Now, in the email I sent out, I asked you, and it's, it's quite an undertaking, quite an assignment. I wanted you to look at the Ten Commandments as they're found in Exodus chapter 20. And then look at them as they're found in Deuteronomy chapter 5, because they're all repeated here. Almost word for word. But Moses makes a few innovations, makes a few changes. And uh, they're... Uh, they're all minor except for one. There's one huge major change when he repeated the Ten Commandments here. A few minor ones, maybe half a dozen or more. But then one major one. Who found what the major change was? Who did their homework? So we can give you some glory right now. Who did their homework? Yes, Lori. Well, give me the major one, the big one you found, the big humongous one. Yes. Yes. To, to guard it. Yeah, but in the second part of the commandment. You're, okay, you got the right commandment. And there is a change. First, in Exodus 20, he says, remember the Sabbath day. But in Deuteronomy, he says, to guard the Sabbath day. That's how it starts. But it's in the second half of the commandment. Yes, Jenna. Bingo. That's exactly right. When you see Jenna Oneg, just tell her, you're so smart, Jenna. <laughs> that was awesome. That was great. Yeah, here's how the commandment reads in Exodus. Exodus 20, verse 8. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to Adonai your God. In it you shall do, not do any work, you or your son or your daughter, your male or your female servant or your cattle or your sojourner who stays with you. And that much is almost identical to the Deuteronomy one. There are a couple little twitches in there like, like Lori pointed out. But then this is where it makes a massive change. 
This is how it continues in Exodus. For in six days Adonai made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them, and rested on the seventh day. Therefore Adonai blessed the seventh day and made it holy. So what's it talking about here? Creation. The Sabbath day is to, to commemorate the fact that God is the creator of the world. That verse does not appear in the Deuteronomy repetition. It's replaced with a different verse. This is what it says in Deuteronomy. It's in chapter 5, verse 15. It says, You shall remember that you were a slave in the land of Egypt, and Adonai your God brought you out of there by a mighty hand, by an outstretched arm. Therefore, Adonai your God command you to make or to do the Sabbath. I like that word make, to make the Sabbath day, to make it. It doesn't refer to creation. What's it referring to? Redemption. So there's an entirely different verse found in Deuteronomy 5 than there is in Exodus 20. That's a huge change. I'm disappointed in all the rest of you, except for Jenna, who didn't discover that. So Exodus is talking about how God is our creator. In Deuteronomy, he is our redeemer. I want you to think about that for a second. He's our creator. He starts the whole thing rolling. And if things didn't go belly up, if we hadn't totally messed things up, we wouldn't need him to redeem us. But somehow along the way, things went really awry. And so then God has to provide redemption. The Exodus 20 chapter comes right after God had redeemed his people out of Egypt. The Deuteronomy chapter comes 40 years later. After that old generation had died and the younger generation grown up and replaced them. And he talks to the younger generation about redemption. And before we go on, I want to introduce you to two of the most powerful words in the Hebrew Bible. This pair of words, this phrase, is found 15 times in the Tanakh, in the Hebrew Scriptures. And it's pronounced Ein Od. The first word on the right is Ein. The word on the left is the word Od. And it means nothing else. Nothing else. When um, Elijah had the woman bring the, the, the vessels so they could fill them with oil, you know, and this thing kept producing oil and oil, kept oil kept coming out. And she said, told her son, bring me more. He says, ain't owed. There's nothing else. There's no more. There's nothing besides these. And then the oil stopped. Ain't owed. There's nothing else. There's no more. This is it. And I want you to hear how this is used. Here are a few places it's found. It's found twice in chapter 4. In verse 35, look what it says. You have been shown in order to know that Adonai, he is God. There is Ain Od. There is nothing else beside him. Not no one else. There's nothing else beside him. Do you have a different verse number in your Bibles? There's some chapters in Deuteronomy where the verse numbers are off. Is that what it says in verse 35? Are we all together? Okay, good. And then go over to verse 39. He says, You shall know this day and take to your heart that Adonai, he is God, in heaven above, on the earth below, Ain Od. There's nothing else. There is nothing else. You know, in this Torah portion, in chapter 6, we're going to come to the Shema. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is the only one. The Lord our God, the Lord is our God, and he is the only one. He is one. Adonai Echad. That one doesn't mean he's, the only, that he's, he's one God or the only God. It means he's, everything is wrapped up into him. That's how the Jews have understood that from day one. Besides him, there's Ain Od. There's nothing else. Isaiah 45 is one of my favorite chapters. We're just going to look at a couple verses, verses 5 and 6. It says that men may know from the rising to the setting of the sun that there is 
No one besides me. There's ain't, oh, there, I am Adonai and there is ain't, oh, there's nothing else besides me. I am Adonai. There is ain't, oh, there's nothing else besides me. There is no God. I will gird you though you've not even known me. Then you go on down to verses 21, 22. Declare and set forth your case. Indeed, let them consult together. Who has announced this from of old? Who has long since declared it? Is it not I, Adonai? And there is an ode beside me. There's nothing else. A righteous God and a Savior. There's none except me. Ain ode. There's not. I'm sorry, a little bit further down. Turn to me and be saved, all the ends of the earth. For I am God. There is an ode. There's nothing else besides me. Nothing. One more. In just a moment. We'll go to Acts 17. I want you to lay hold of this. I want you to, if you have to close your eyes and think about this, do it. But to the degree you think and you feel in your heart there's something else in the universe besides God, to that degree your faith is too small. To the degree you think there's something in the universe other than God and what is under his control, to that degree your faith is too small. We say, well, Grant, how about the devil? Who made the devil? Knowing exactly what he would do, and also told us that he would destroy him with the, with the breath of his lips. God did. In fact, in Isaiah 45, we didn't read this verse, what we should have. We're going to now. In Isaiah 45, listen to what he says. Verse 7, we read this every Shabbat morning in the liturgy. In verse 6, we read that I am Adonai, there's Eno, there's nothing besides me. The one forming the light... And what? Creating the darkness. Causing well-being. Creating evil. I'm Adonai. Who does all these? He takes all credit for everything that's in the world. And yet you still have free will somehow. Does God commit sin? No. Is there darkness in God? Not a bit. He is light in him and there is no darkness. But many times the scripture we're told he dwells in the darkness. He's hidden. He's hidden from view for the time being. It says that to him the darkness is like the light. Nothing hides anything from his sight. You think in the dark you can do things, get away with it? God sees it all. But you, this, is a, this takes a stretch of faith. But to the degree you can lay hold of this. That God is everywhere and in everything and he runs the world. He's totally in charge. The more you lay hold of that, the more you will never have fear in your life. You will lose your critical spirit. You'll lose anxiety. Because as your faith in him grows, you begin to realize he runs the world perfectly. He created the world knowing exactly what Adam and Eve would do. And it didn't cause him to bat an eyelash. So he had it planned out from the beginning. He knew what they would do. He knew the death and the havoc it would bring in the world. And through it all, he has not lost control. And when you go to the end of the book, the last two chapters of Revelation, everything's brought back together. All the tears are wiped away. And he's dwelling with his people. Because he's the creator. And what he creates, he redeems. He puts it all back together. He created Adam. What did he do? Split him in half. Well, that's an ugly mess. But what did he do with the half he took away? He created a bride for Adam, brought them back together. He's one again. He was one. that was split open. Then he becomes one again. And that last oneness was far superior to the first. God has allowed the entire universe to crack open, but he's in control. He's in control of it. And he brings it all back together. And every knee will bow, every tongue confess that Yeshua is Lord to the glory of God. Won't that be something? And if your faith can't latch onto that, you need stronger faith. And if you think there's something other than God in control in this world or in your life, you need stronger faith. Because to the degree you believe there's something else, 
which would be yesh owed, there is something else, to that degree, your faith is too small. It's broken. It's too weak. And you're going to have worry and anxiety. And a, lot of, a lot of emotional pain. I don't like pain. And I have found as my faith grows and the more I latch onto this, worry and pain and fear go away. Not because of me, because of who he is. So let's go back to this. When we light candles in our house and other homes I've been in, when the woman lights the candles on Shabbat evening, she lights them and Robin will say this is to remind us that God is our creator. She lights the other one and says, and our redeemer. Our creator and our redeemer. And if you're doing your Friday night liturgy, hopefully this is part of it. It's a phrase, you'll find it if you have your your prayer books with you. It's on page 25 in your prayer book. It's a very ancient part of the the, the Arab Shabbat Kiddush of when you you have the wine and you have the bread. And between the blessing over the wine and the blessing over the bread, these are the words that are said. Blessed are you, Adonai, our God, King of the universe, who has sanctified us with his commandments, took pleasure in us, and with love and favor gave us his holy Shabbat as a heritage. What's the next phrase? A remembrance of what? Creation. And the prologue, or beginning of our holy gatherings, our holy convocations. A memorial of the what? The Exodus of Egypt. That's redemption. And your holy Shabbat with love and favor did you give us as a heritage. Blessed are you, Adonai, who sanctifies the Shabbat, the Sabbath. You see that? That needs to be a part of what you say on Friday night. You do the blessing over the cup and everybody shares in that. Then you do this. And then you do the bread. Right in the middle of the, the, the Kiddush of the bread and cup. These are the words. To remind us that the Sabbath is a, re, is a re memorial of the creation and a memorial of our redemption. Now, what do we normally do during the year to memorialize our redemption? What do we normally do in the spring? Passover. Passover. Yeah. God's given this beautiful, wonderful feast, the best meal of the year, and to commemorate our exodus from Egypt, our exodus from sin, from slavery, passed from death to life, slavery to freedom. Wonderful. And Yeshua says, do this in remembrance of me, not just of what God did through Moses and the Passover lamb, but do it in remembrance of me now. Because the one is a picture of the other. The Passover lamb is a picture of me. Okay? So now we have two things. We have a stereo picture. We have a 3D picture at Passover. We think about the exodus from Egypt. We think about what happened on the same day of the year, Many years later, when Yeshua died on the cross for our sins and our redemption. In other words, every Friday night, when we light the candles, we take the wine and we take the bread. It's like a little mini Passover Seder once a week on a Friday night. Okay? And we memorialize our redemption and the fact that God's our creator. And it's based on the verse that's found in Exodus, but not Deuteronomy, and the one found in Deuteronomy, but not in Exodus, when it comes to the commandment about the Sabbath. So we have two things to do on Sabbath. To remember that God created us. We are his idea. And he thought you were worthwhile bringing into reality. But you messed up. He knew you would. He's your redeemer too. He repairs you. And this is what's amazing. I mean, look at 2 Corinthians 5.17. Paul is aware of this. And look what he says. Therefore, if anyone is united with Messiah, he's a new what? He's a new creation. How did he get the new creation? The old's passed away. Look what has come, fresh and new. Now, all these things are from God who consiled us to himself. That's redemption. See what he's doing? But he's doing them in the reverse order. He's saying... Yeah, God is your creator, but you totally messed up, so now he's your redeemer. But now he's redeemed you, he's made you a new creation, (laughs) okay? Isn't that amazing? Isn't that wonderful? A new creation. So you can memorialize on Shabbat the fact not only is he creator of the world, the creator of you, 
But he's made you a new creation through his redemption. I hope you think about these things on Shabbat. And when you take the bread, think about Messiah's body that delivered you from death, from, from slavery to freedom. Think of the wine of his blood that passed you from death to life. Think about these things. But remember, he's your creator. He is the one who started it all off, knowing every detail of what would happen. He's like an author who knew every word before he wrote it. And as your redeemer, as his, as your redeemer, he makes you a new creation. Completely restores what was lost. Completely restores. This is the amazing thing about our redeemer. I'm so glad he's a creator too. Because he can take everything that was lost, all the tohu and vohu. You know, it says there, uh, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was tohu and vohu. It was dark and formless and empty, chaotic. And then he restores it. Six days, brand new, better than before. As a creator, his redemption makes you a new creation better than before. And he takes all the chaos in your life and uses it. He takes all the pain, all the failures. That becomes part of your story. It's part of what you carry with you that makes you who you are. You follow? Don't let anything be wasted. Don't let it be wasted. Did you sin? Did you really, really mess up in your past? Yeah. Did God forgive you and redeem you from that? Yeah. Now you're wiser than you were before. Should we sin so that grace may abound? God forbid. No. But since you have sinned and God's redeemed you, let that experience make you wiser and more effective in his hand to reach other people. Nothing's wasted. Nothing's wasted. Not a thing. God's even control of all of our failures. That's the kind of God we have. Are you able to stretch your faith to encompass this kind of a God? Well, where are we? There's one other, we're talking about some of the little changes between the first set of Ten Commandments in Exodus 20 and and the repetition in Deuteronomy 5. This is one of my favorites. In Deuteronomy 5, 16, says, Honor your father and your mother, as Adonai your God has commanded you, that your days may be prolonged, and that it may be good for you upon the land which Adonai your God gives you. Now, that phrase, that it may be good for you, is not in the Exodus 20 version. That was added. In fact, the word good does not appear on the first set of Ten Commandments. It appears here in the new set. And some rabbis, as rabbis do, they, they go through and they, they counted the words and they realized that uh, in the first set of commandments in Exodus 20, there are 172 words. I love this. So in Exodus 20, you read the Ten Commandments, 172 words in the Hebrew. But here in Deuteronomy 5, there are 189 words. And I know many of you are already doing the math. What's the difference between the two? I heard someone say 16. They must have gone to Springfield where I graduated. What's the answer? (laughs) 17. Thank you. It's 17. 17 word difference. 17 equals the word... Tov, which means good. Every word has a numerical value. Every letter's numerical value. And this set of commandments contains the word good. Because God had done a deeper work of redemption in this new generation that he had in the old one. They'd all come out of Egypt. But this one had experienced a renewal of life. And they weren't going to commit the act of faithlessness that their forefathers did who came out of Egypt 40 years earlier. And of course, in our Torah portion in chapter 6, we have the Shema, which is the central theme, the central statement 
of Judaism and also the greatest commandment. When Yeshua was asked, what's the greatest commandment? He didn't say, love God with all your heart, soul, and strength. He said, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one, and you shall love the Lord your God with all your, all your heart, with all your soul, and all your strength. He started with the Shema, hear, listen. That's the greatest commandment. And you do it out of love. Now, this is a mezuzah scroll. That's what I have on the screen here. You know what a mezuzah is? Um, a mezuzah is one of these little containers you put on the, the right-hand doorpost of your door. They usually tilt them in. Do you know why they tilt them in? It's in the Shulchan Aruch. <laughs> they tilt them like this. It's because some rabbis said they should be vertical. Others said they should be horizontal, so they compromised. <laughs> That's the truth. And all this is a box, and artists go crazy with these. They make the most beautiful things. They make them out of stone, out of wood, out of metal, out of glass. They mix materials. They're colorful. They're, they're, they're just gorgeous. They're works of art. But that's not the important part. It's what's inside. What's inside is a scroll. Here's one. This is on parchment. It's hand done with a small quill pen. And this is what you see up here on the screen. This is what's important. And here... At the top is Deuteronomy 6, verses 4 through 9. These are the words, Hear, O Israel, Adonai is our God. Adonai is the one and only. You shall love Adonai your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your resources. These matters I command you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them thoroughly to your children. You shall speak of them while you sit in your home, while you walk on the way, when you retire, when you arise. Bind them as a sign upon your arm. Let them be ornaments between your eyes. And write them on the doorpost, the mezuzot of your house and upon your gates. That's the first half a dozen lines there or so. Now you'll notice something interesting. The word Shema ends in the letter Ayin. It's written oversize. Shema Yisrael Adonai. There's God's name right there. Yad Hey Vav Hey. Eloheinu. And there's his name again. Adonai Echad. And Echad ends with an oversized letter. It's the way it is in every Torah scroll in the world. Why do they make these two letters big? Well, for this one, there's a good reason. The letter Dalit there looks very much like the letter Resh. It just has a rounded corner. Now, they want to make sure you know that's a Dalit, not a Resh. Because if you make that letter Resh, instead of Echad, it becomes Achar. The Lord our God is another God. The word Achar means another. They want you to know Adonai our God is Echad. He's one. He's the only one. He's the Ein Od. And then over here, this is the letter Ayin. Ayin means I. They're saying, hear Shema, but you better see as well. And we read during our prayer time the last chapter of, of, uh, of Job. God had, had appeared in the whirlwind, and he pointed out all these things in nature, the oceans, the skies, the stars, the birds, the, the donkey, the, the goat, the, the uh, rain. It, it, he pointed out all these things. And said, Job, I made that. I made this. Did you do this? I made this. This is all me. This is all me. And finally, Job says, I repent in dust and ashes. He says, I'd heard of you by the hearing of the ear, but now my eye sees you. The thing is, Job didn't see God. It was just a whirlwind he saw. But when God pointed out all the things in the world around Job, Job suddenly began to see God in all of them. He says, now my eye sees you. I'll never look at a tree the same way. I'll never look at the rain the same way. I'll never look at the stars the same way. I'll never look at the ocean. I'll never look at that goat or the ostrich, which is mentioned. I'll never look at anything you've ever made in the same way because I realize they're created by your voice, and therefore it's a message from you. It's an expression of your heart. And you're talking to me everywhere I look. It's you surrounding me and speaking to me. But I couldn't see it before. Now I do. You understand? It's a powerful insight. So God wants us to hear Shema, but the last letter of Shema is I, Ayin. Now, if you take these two letters and put them together, they spell Ayin Dalit, which is the word aid, which means testimony. This is your testimony. 
Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. That is our testimony of the world. He's the only God. There's nothing else beside him. And if we live like that, the world around us is going to be changed. It'll never be the same. It'll never be the same. And then the rest of the parchment is from Deuteronomy 11, verses 13 to 21. And we've got time. We'll go ahead and read that bit. It comes from uh, next week's Torah portion. But 11.13, if you turn there, it says this. It will be that if you hear my commandments, I command you today. And by the way, do you know what the Hebrew word for obey is? It's the word shema here. There is no other word for obey. To hear means to obey. If you're not obeying, you're not hearing. The word shema means hear, but also means obedience. If you're not obeying, you're not hearing. So he says, it will be if you hear my commandments, I command you today, to love Adonai your God and to serve him with all your heart, with all your soul. Then I shall provide rain for your land in its proper time, the early and the late rains that you may gather in your grain, your wine, and your oil. Grain is good for one thing, for food. Wine is good for two things, food and medicine. Oil is good for three things, food and medicine and light. With God, everything gets better and better and better. I shall provide grass in your field for your cattle. You will eat and you will be satisfied. But guard yourselves lest your heart be seduced that you turn astray. And serve other gods and prostrate yourself to them. Then the wrath of Adonai will blaze against you. He will restrain the heavens so there will be no rain. Now when we think of God's wrath, think of a thunderbolt coming out and just turn us into a chunk of charcoal. No, God's wrath is expressed by lack of rain. And the ground not yields produce. It's his wrath is is, um, exhibited in your life when your work does not produce fruit. You toil, but there's not much to show for it. Don't think God's wrath is this lightning bolt comes out of the sky. It's just the removal of his blessing. So if you're working and straining and it's just things don't come together, that's God's wrath. Why is he wrathful? You're not listening to him. You're not putting him first. You're not seeing him everywhere. You're not doing his will. And you will be swiftly banished from the goodly land that Adonai gives you. In other words, you're not enjoying your inheritance. You're not enjoying the life that he meant you to have. You shall place these words of mine upon your heart and upon your soul. You shall bind them for a sign upon your arm and let them be an ornament between your eyes. You shall teach them to your children to discuss them while you sit in your home, while you walk on the way, when you retire, when you arise. You shall write them on the the bezuzot, the doorpost of your house, and upon your gates. In order to prolong your days and the days of your children upon the land that Adonai has sworn to your fathers to give them like the days of the heaven over the earth. We pray, may your kingdom come, may your will be done on earth as is in heaven. How do we, how, how do we have God's will done on earth? By obeying his commandments. Remember, the Torah is spiritual, came from him. When we obey it, his kingdom is descending it starts in our homes, starts in our own lives, in our homes, and among our children. Like the days of the heavens upon the earth. Isn't that what we want? When you submit your life, your possessions, your time, your strength to God's word, God's kingdom shows up. Now someday, Messiah is returning, and the whole world will see his kingdom established in a very visible way. But right now, his kingdom, Yeshua says, is among you. It's right there in your midst. We can bring the days of heaven to earth in our lives and in our families and in our homes by putting him first. Got it? It's a blessing issue. It's not a salvation issue. It's a blessing issue. And I want you to be blessed. I want to finish with this. When we were talking last night, Robin said, this is my new favorite verse. Deuteronomy 5.27. I think it's verse 30. Verse I've read, never noticed. Just read over it. God tells Moses, go say to them, return to your tents. And 
In other words, what you're looking for isn't out there. Go back to your tents. I'm right there with you. Be still. Be content. Quit exploring after your eyes and your hearts. Go in your tents. Your tent is your body. Your tent is your realm. He says, be content where I've put you. Be content in your tent. That'd be a good bumper sticker. How many of you have strayed from your tent? Someone asks you, where are you from? Oh, I'm from over there at the tent. Go back. Be in your tent. Be where you're supposed to be. Every man at his own camp, every man at his own banner. Quit straying away from where God's placed you. Quit always looking for the next big thing. You know, so many times we, we, I've gone on about this before, and with this I'll, I'll finish. We talk about people want to be these Christian celebrities. They want to go and do these great things for God. I want God's will for my life. Then I saw an advertisement for a fake book. It was a spoof. It's called, I want God's life for my will. Too many times that's what it is. I want God to come endorse my will. I want him to say, your will be done, not mine. He says, that doesn't work that way. I want his will for my life. He says, go back to your tent. Where have I planted you? That's where I want you to be. And when it's time to move your tent, I'll make it crystal clear to you. In the meantime, be content in your tent. All right? We've gone over a few minutes. Is there a burning question or, or comment that uh, we need to take time for? A burning question. Yes, right here. So let's get a microphone over here. Check. One question. The book you read from and all the volumes that go with it. Yes, yeah, the Shulchan Aruch. Why is that not considered adding to the word of God? I, it is. I, I'm giving you as an example of what it means to add to the Word of God. Let's not do it. <laughs> yeah. I have it because I'm curious, and sometimes I just want to see what they say about things. And whew, I th- I'm so glad that, uh, that this is not a yoke that God has given me to bear. The Torah is a bearable yoke. This is not bearable. His yoke is easy. His burden is light. This is not an easy burden. So I'm glad you asked that, clarified that. And yes, right down here. Let's get a... Yeah, but people can't hear you on the recording. And everybody wants to hear what you have to say. So, Yes, yeah, we'll get it in stereo. <laughs> um, in Deuteronomy 4, where it says not to add to the word, yeah. do you think that relates to <laughs> Revelation 22, 18, and 19, where it says what's going to happen to us if we add or take away from the word? <coughs> Excuse me. Yeah, that passage that John puts in Revelation 22 is directly taken from Deuteronomy. And he's talking about the words of the revelation. And he's saying, don't add to the words of this revelation, don't take away. And yet, people comment on the book of Revelation are adding to it all the time and taking away from it all the time. That's why I will never teach on the book of Revelation. Nobody understands it anyway. And for the last 2,000 years, every generation and every commentary in Revelation says, oh, it's all happening right now. We're at the seventh seal, the seventh bowl, the seventh trumpet. is going. It's coming down right now. And they still do the same thing today. Nobody writes a book and says, oh, I think we're maybe at the first seal, but we've got, you know, three more to go. And, oh, I think we're at the second bowl, five more to go. If you don't know what the bowls and seals are, you need to read Revelation. There's a blessing promised to the people who read Revelation. There's no blessing promised to people who understand it because nobody does. So read it. Read it. It's a blessing. But you're not going to hear me teach it. Maybe the first three chapters, the last two chapters. I feel comfortable with those. Everything in between, I think when those things are happening, we're going through them, then we'll understand what they are. We probably won't need anybody to teach us. But right now, it's a sealed book. It's a great mystery. There are things there that, that we can dip into and apply. But, but uh, you're not going to hear me teaching on Revelation. Reading it, yes, teaching it, no. All right, I'm glad you brought that up. Thank you. 
All right, I see Brandon. We're going to take time for one more. I see a hand back there. Uh, we'll take two more. Is that okay? All right, you're going to be mad at those two guys, not me, if we take their two questions. All right. All right, Brandon, yes. Um, so you, you said, or Deuteronomy says, and you, that you know, there's nothing else other than God. And one thing Amen. that kind of came to mind was, so we, we have free will, right? And so I think that, or I was kind of playing around with the thought that, so if, I think you said one time that the seeds of our own destruction are in ourselves. Yes. And if we choose to destroy ourselves, isn't God almost taking a hands-off approach? And isn't, in a sense, that something else? I mean, what's your thoughts on that? Um, well, th- you're asking me how God's sovereignty and our free will intersect with each other. And that's way above my pay grade. So when I'm older and smarter, then maybe I'll have an answer for you. All I know is, is the Bible teaches God is totally, absolutely sovereign, runs the world. We also absolutely, totally have free will. You must believe both of those. We want to figure out how they can both be at the same time. I don't know. But God teaches them both. That's called Hebraic logic. This is true. That's true. I believe them both. I don't know how they can both be occurring at the same time. Quantum physics, I don't get it. But we believe both of them. You believe one or the other, you have issues. You believe them both, you get balance. So, God runs the world. Oh, I feel peaceful. God gives me free will. I feel responsible. And with that, I can have balance. Okay? So, thanks for the question. Although the answer probably didn't help out a whole lot. And then the last one back here. Yes. Um, Exodus sixteen twenty three. This just has to do with the cooking. Um, it says, this is that which the Lord has said, tomorrow is the rest of the Holy Sabbath to the Lord. Bake that which you will bake today, and what you will boil, boil today, and that which remains over, lay it for you to be kept until the morning. And I just wondered, isn't this where Jews get to not cook on the Sabbath? Uh, that, I'm sure that's part of it. Um, the bigger part is you don't make a fire on the Sabbath, and you're not supposed to even take advantage of a fire that was lit before. So, um, I'll loan you this if you want to look into it and get yeah. back with this. <laughs> but I'm sure that's a huge part of it, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, they, anything is considered work you don't do. So, they define work by the activities that took place in construction of the tabernacle. So, cutting and tearing and uh, sewing and carrying. and all the, they, they look at all those. They realized to, to do the metals, they had, to, they had to heat things and melt them. So, they can't do that with food either. So they come up with like these, how many are there, um, 36 forbidden activities? Is it 36? 39, thank you, 39. 39 forbidden activities. And then they take that and apply that to all kinds of things out beyond that. And it just gets really complicated. I know one thing, you would not want me up here teaching if I did not have my coffee in the morning. I know that, so... All right, good comments, and uh, we need to have another bait midrash sometime. Um, when it, on that comment on Anode, I just want to close with this. We'll close in prayer. Father, we thank you so much for your holy word, for your Torah, for it is our life. It's our wisdom and discernment among the peoples around us. We thank you there's nothing beside you. And I think of the words that Paul shared on Mars Hill in Athens with people who are all idolaters. And he said to them, for in God, we live and we move and we have our being. Paul understood what it meant that there's nothing else beside you. For it's in you we live. It's in you we move. We can't go anywhere where you're not there. And it's in you we have our very being, even when we misuse it. So, Father, stretch our faith. So it's a faith that's worthy of such a great and worthy God as yourself. And we ask these things in the name of our precious Savior, Yeshua.